get to the good stuff, Revelation chapter 12. Would you turn there? Revelation chapter 12 for our message entitled, Still Standing. Revelation chapter 12. We're going to be reading verses 7 through 12. So follow along with me or up on the screen if you didn't bring your Bible with you. Revelation chapter 12, starting at verse 7, says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Revelation chapter 12 is the insight about the devil's final boot, if you will, getting kicked out of his access of heaven. And you might say, well, I thought that happened a long time ago. It did in him losing his role and him losing his position as the anointed cherub, as we see, you can read the details in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. But mysteriously, for some reason, the Lord has still allowed for all of these centuries gone by, these millennium, for the devil to still have access into the very presence of God, to the very throne room of God, even though he's lost his position. And he comes there for a specific purpose, and that specific purpose is to come and to accuse the brethren day and night before our God. The devil loves to accuse you and to ridicule you and to point out your flaws and your sins and your failures and your struggles to God. And the bad news is, is that he usually has truth in that realm to cast before God's throne about our own human sin, failure, iniquity, transgressions. And yet, as we'll see here today, through this process, we get three dynamic, life-changing, powerful truths that will help us still be standing as we go through this life and the spiritual battle and the spiritual warfare that we experience in this life to really put courage and steel in our backbone, to know that you and I are not fighting for the victory in our Christian life, but we're actually fighting from a place of victory because Jesus has made the way for us to be able to stand. As it says in Ephesians chapter six, stand in the Lord and the power of his might that you might resist the devil in that evil day when he attacks us. Now, what we discover here is that the angel, and and as if the Lord doesn't want you to be um, mystery bound by who this is, it says that great dragon, the serpent of old, the devil, and Satan. I mean, there's no mistaking, obviously, who this is. And him and his angels fought with Michael, the archangel, and his angels. Now, according to the earlier portion of this chapter 12, The devil took a third with his tail. He drew a third of the stars. This is a symbol of him taking a third of the angels created by God in his fall and in his rebellion and in his deception. But in this day, this day that we're reading about right now is yet future. It's a time that when all of this is unfolding at the great tribulation, it is the time that now his access is suppressed, kicked out. Michael and his angels throw him out so that he can't come anymore. As a matter of fact, it tells us there in verse 12 that the heaven rejoices because he's not coming in, ruining things anymore. And the earth, woe unto them because the devil knows his time is short. And so misery loves company. He's gonna wreak as much havoc as he possibly can through this period of time on planet earth. Well, how's that affect you and I? 
I want to look at a couple of pictures that we see in the Old Testament about how this accusation and accusing of the brethren takes place in the Bible as our illustrations and then apply it to our life personally because you're going to experience it too. First, and we're not going to turn there, is Job chapter 1. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, we see this unfolding as Satan, it says, came in with the sons of God. He presented himself before the Lord. Angels came in before God's presence and God asked him, he said, hey, Satan, where you been? His response is, going to and fro throughout the earth. Now, Peter tells us that he goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So he just goes all over the planet seeing whose day he can ruin, who he can get into temptation, who he can destroy their lives. And so the Lord begins to boast and brag on his boy Job. He says, well, have you considered my servant Job? Upright man, shuns evil, loves good, great guy. Now, this was Satan's first accusation against Job. He said, does he serve you for no reason? You've so blessed his life and put a hedge of protection around him that I can't get to him. Oh, the devil had wanted to ruin Job's wonderful, peaceful walk with God many times. But God had this hedge of protection, this wall, this fortress around Job's life that the devil could not get to him. What a great picture that is of the hedge and the wall that God puts up around our life. And as a matter of fact, nothing can happen to your life unless the devil asks for permission as we see in the story of Job. And so the Lord tells him, well, he's upright. But Satan's accusation, his charge was, you know what? If you take the blessings away from Job's life, he'll curse you to your face. That's the charge. He basically portrayed Job as a mercenary, somebody that basically is hired with a price tag. That Job serves God because of the price tag of the blessing of God. But if you took the blessings away, and I think that's pretty accurate, humanly speaking, don't you think? We do a lot of counseling around this place and how many people that I've met that are angry and bitter at God and shaking their fists at the heavens because the blessings have left their life. And yet you know the story the Lord says he limits first he lowers the hedge and he says okay you can get at his stuff take all of his stuff and you actually even can take all of his children but you can't touch his body you can't touch his person the Lord limits what Satan can do and he loses his camels he loses his uh, cattle he loses his sheep he loses his donkeys he loses his servants they're killed and then his ten children are killed in a catastrophe as the wind blew the house down and crushed his seven sons and his three daughters but what was the charge? He'll curse you to your face. So when the servant came and told Job all these things, Job said this, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And he worshiped God. He worshiped God. Job's a mind-blowing dude. He's a spiritual guy. You know what? He doesn't have Job chapter one and two to read to know what's going on. He's going through it as he speaks. It makes you think, doesn't it? If God's just a little bit proud of you, would he please not tell the devil on you? And so we see the accusation, and it goes all the way through. Job curses the day of his birth. Uh, he, his wife tried to encourage him to curse God and die, but even at the end, he does get rebuked out of the whirlwind by the Lord. But ultimately, Job stood the test because God knew what kind of material Job was made of, and Satan brought his accusations against him to try him, to test his faith, to put it to the test. And if it happened to Job, don't think you're going to be exempt from the trials and the tests of life to see if your heart is really God's or not. But there's one that I think that for me anyway, it so relates to my life. I want to share it with you, and hopefully it'll relate to you. If you'd turn to Zechariah chapter 3 with me this morning, if you're new to the Bible, just want to encourage you, go left in your Bible, go past the Gospels, you'll hit a book called Malachi, or Malachi, however you want to pronounce it. And right after Malachi, you'll see Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3, one of the minor prophets. I want to paint the picture. Joshua is the high priest. He's basically Pastor Joshua of the children of Israel in Jerusalem. And there's a governor by the name of Zerubbabel. And God's called these guys to be the spiritual leaders that will ramrod the job of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. But we see a great conflict as the accuser of the brethren accuses Joshua. And I think this is exactly how Joshua is feeling. He feels inadequate. He feels dirty morally. He feels like he's not up to the task. God's called him to a great task. And here he is, just a man. 
look at it with me. We start in verse 1. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand, notice, to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house, and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. What's going on is God's called Joshua to be the high priest, the minister that would bring, present the Lord to the people and also intercede on the people's behalf to the Lord through the Old Testament offerings of sacrifices. But Joshua, it says, was in filthy garments. Filthy garments in the Bible point to the reality of moral uncleanness. Joshua was a sinner just like you and me. You see the misconception that people have is that people that are ministers of the Lord, whether they're a high priest in the Old Testament or they're a pastor today, or they're a Billy Graham or a Chuck Swindoll or somebody that is of some stature, what people think is that, well, you know, they're really not like me. They somehow got this special cookie from heaven that exempts them from the trials, temptations, sins, and failures of life. And it's just not so. I mean, if you were to be really honest, you don't think that I'm just like you. I am just like you. If you struggle with temptation this week, or this is your temptation, or this is your struggle, what you struggle with that guy at work that drives you bananas, you're struggling with your teenager, you're struggling with this or that, my experiences are exactly like yours. You say, oh, no, they're not. You should be, see what's in my mind this last week. Oh, I know. I have those same kind of weird, radical thoughts. Do you ever shock yourself by the thoughts you have? Like, whoa, I can't believe I had that thought. Man, where'd that come from? You startle yourself that you would have such a thought about this or that. But the bottom line is usually God's people or people in the world do not think that those who serve the Lord in that capacity, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, that they are not... They don't put their pants on one leg at a time like everybody else, but they do. And most of them that I know feel the same way as Joshua. Here Joshua is called to do a task. He's called to be the leader in a very crucial time there in Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, and he doesn't feel up to the task. As a matter of fact, the devil is pointing his boiling finger of accusation, opposing him. How does he oppose us? He does it in two ways. He opposes us to speak into our own minds, and he assaults who we are before God's throne. And that's the picture that you see in chapter 3 of Zechariah. Joshua, no doubt, had feelings that ran along these lines. Man, I'm not up for the task. And man, I'm struggling in my own marriage. Or I'm struggling with my own temptations. And I have this, this lustful thought. Or I have this hateful thought. Or I have this selfish thought. Or I have this wicked thought. Or, and, I, and, I, and, and Lord, you, you got to choose somebody else. you got to choose somebody that's really got their act together more than me. Because I am not up for this job and the devil helps out by coming along and saying yeah you're not up for this job you hypocrite look at you irritable with your kids this week selfish treating your wife like a jerk look at you you're going to go stand up before God's people and share with them you hypocrite you got nothing to share you should just shut your mouth and stay at home how do I know this dialogue so well? Because it's a regular part of my experience. Being so aware, as Joshua is here in his filthy garments, being so aware of the voice of the enemy opposing him, being so aware that I, like you, am a man, as it says in Hebrews, of God's spiritual leaders, beset by weakness, just like you. A person that 
struggles through life trusting God just like you. And yet the Lord gives him clean clothes. The Lord rebukes the enemy. The Lord gives him a clean turban. The Lord gives him basically a new set of duds to say, I have washed you. I have cleansed you. Now go get the job done, Joshua. I have put you over the courts of the house of the Lord. Now now just go do it. And the Lord and I have had conversations many times about this. I mean, I think the Lord should call angels to be preachers, don't you? I mean, angels that don't struggle with the same infirmities that you and I have. I mean, just just send one through the air at 8 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and 10 o'clock. Just kind of like the news. Just send them through the air. Preach them. Wait a second. Here comes the 12 o'clock. Let's hear Hear the message preached. But no, he's chosen to use people like us. Like Paul said, as he spoke to Timothy, he said, God has chosen me to be the chief of sinners so that in me, God's grace might be revealed to other people that if God can save a guy, Paul was saying, like me, God can save anybody. And if God can use a guy like me, God can use anybody. And it's that reality in the accusation and the conflict that is going on, whether it was in Job's life, the accusation was, he only serves you because you bless him. Take away the blessings, he'll curse you to your face. For Joshua, he tried to get him stopped dead in his tracks before he could even do ministry. Here the devil saying, you can't use this guy. Look at him, his weakness, his infirmities, his struggles. He's so human. You can't use this guy. And yet the Lord rebukes Satan, puts new clothes on him, and says, yes, I can use him because that's what I do in my grace. And there's a misconception as God begins to use our lives, that there are those who say, wow, look what God is doing through you. (laughs) Folks, do you know that what God is doing, I can only vouch for myself, you know what God's doing through my life is in spite of me, not because of me. Do you get that? In spite of me, in my humanness, God's doing a cool thing because that's what he likes to do so that everybody can say, you know what, it must be God because it's not a man. Now, back in Revelation chapter 12, we see this, if you will, amped up in a re- way that when we put Job's story together and we put Zechariah's story about the high priest Joshua together, we see in verse 10 when it declares, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. But notice the remedy, the three things that you and I can have victory and still stand after the dust settles in our spiritual conflict. Verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. That time is yet future when the devil no longer has access to heaven to accuse us. But right now, as you and I sit here, as we are in this place, as of now, this day has not yet come. And the devil is constantly going before God's throne and accusing you before God's throne of grace. He's also whispering condemnation in your ear. And you have to discern as you grow in your walk with the Lord, when you have this this thought, these thoughts and these impressions that are condemning in nature, sometimes a young Christian, an immature Christian, thinks that's the voice of God condemning them, that he's angry at them, and it's just not so. The conviction of God's Spirit always, always, always is drawing me to forgiveness and restoration in my relationship with God. It's always drawing me to the house of the Lord. It's always drawing me back to his word. It's always drawing me. That's what the conviction of the spirit of God does and the love of God does, but the enemy of our soul, the devil, he condemns us. He says, why do you guys even go into church today? What's the matter with you? Look at your life, trying to be a Christian in front of your kids. You're a joke. Some of you had a struggle just getting to church today because you had those feelings as if, to me, it overwhelms me like this. It's a sense of guilty feelings when I know I haven't even done anything wrong. You ever feel that way? man, I feel this heaviness and this sense of guilt, but I look at my, I haven't done, you know, there are other times I have a sense of guilt. I have been bad. So then I got to repent of that. But there's this overwhelming condemnation that I feel like, man, I, I, I shouldn't even go open my mouth. Yet the enemy is the accuser. If you can picture God's courtroom, because it seems to lay it out this way, we can put the verses together to put the pieces of the puzzle of the throne room of God. Satan as of now, still has access to heaven. And he comes in as the prosecuting attorney to lay all the charges against you, against me. And he does it before the judge of all the earth, our father in heaven. 
And fortunately for us, as he's charging us, telling us we've done this wrong and we had this lustful thought or we had this angry thought or we were selfish or we spoke these words or we did this act or we did this or that, and, and he charges us with those things. Without these three things, first of all, the blood of Jesus and the testimony of our lives and that we do not love our lives unto death, we're sunk. But Satan only accuses God's people who are not perfect but simply forgiven by the grace of God. So this first one is so crucially important for you to be able to stand through the Christian life and the accusations and the condemnation of the enemy. Because you see, usually when the devil comes along and accuses me or condemns me or points out sins and flaws and faults in my life, I have to agree with him, right? Because those, those things are true about me. He knows me well, he's been observing me. But this little phrase, little saying came out a few years ago, I like it. The next time the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. He's going to hell. He's going to a lake of fire. And so I know that this is true about me. But here, it says that they overcame him. How do we overcome the enemy and his condemnation and his accusation? Through the blood of the lamb. Man, this is the beautiful, powerful truth of the Christian life. By the blood of the lamb. You see... When God sent his only son into the world to die upon the cross for us, his blood that was shed from his veins, from his wrists, from his hands, from his, his side where blood and water flowed forth as that soldier plunged that spear right through his rib cage, right into his heart. And that blood and water flowed. As it says in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all sin. All sin. Now, that word all in the Greek is an amazing word. It means all. Because you see, the thing is, when I talk to you about these things, there are those who have a problem with forgiveness. They don't accept it, or they don't realize it, or they don't embrace it. How am I going to overcome the enemy? I'm going to realize that the blood of Jesus that was shed for me is sufficient to forgive me for every sinful thought, action, word, deed, everything I've ever done up into this point, up into this very nanosecond, my entire life is under the cleansing, forgiving, washing blood of the Lamb. I stand at this moment right now before God, cleansed by His blood, uncondemnable, totally righteous and perfect in the sight of God. That's what the blood of Jesus and Jesus taking our place and being our substitute accomplishes for us. So you're here today and you're haunted by something you did last week. You're haunted by something you did 10 years ago. You're haunted by this or that and the blood of Jesus washes it away and as the enemy tries to throw it in your face, you say, yeah, that, that is true about me but now the blood of Jesus has washed it all away. And from this nanosecond in the future, everything that's in my future as I walk by faith trusting Jesus, all of my sin, all my failure because I have sin, fault and failure in the future. I mean, I don't want to. It's like John talking to the recipients of his letter in 1 John chapter 2, and he says, I have written to you, little children, that you may not sin. That's the goal. But when, if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who will bring forgiveness of your sins, not only to you, but he died for the sins of the whole world. So in that process, that amazing process, all of my future from this day forward, is under the cleansing, forgiving, perfecting blood of the Lamb. Everything in my future, I have nothing to fear. It's all going to be under the blood. Everything from my past, it's all under the blood. And so as the devil accuses me, if I don't know this truth, I go, yeah, you're right. I am kind of a schmuck. I just mess up. And I'm just, why, why even go to church? Why even try the Christian life? Because I'm under the blood of the Lamb, and I'm totally sinless in God's sight. The righteousness that was the Lord Jesus's, he gives to us. Paul says it this way to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he says, He who knew no sin, that's Jesus, became sin for us that we, who basically only knew sin, would become the righteousness of God. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe because you and I had a debt we could not pay. Yeah, but there are those who are sitting here. Yes, I meet them all the time. You're either too bad a sinner or you're too good a sinner. What do I mean by that? Well, there are those who say, well, you don't know what I've done. 
I invite somebody to church in town. Say, hey, you know, you ought to come to church. Come on out to Calvary. This is the service time. Oh, if I went there, the roof would cave in. And you know, you never seen somebody like me. Blah, 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 blah. I said, if that was true, there would be a crater out on Hit Road. You know those people out there? Why are you wicked people saved by God's grace? Praise the Lord. Now, oh, yeah, I'm too bad. Oh, I don't know what the roof would cave in. And they go, think about all this stuff. Do you, do you think, I remember sitting with a woman that was just weeping and sobbing one day. She said, oh, years ago, Pastor, I, could, I asked her what, if she, why she wouldn't get right with Jesus. She said, years ago, I committed the unpardonable sin. And I said, well, I know what the unpardonable sin is, so would you rely on mind relating to me what you believe the unpardonable sin is? She said, I committed adultery on my husband. And I said, well, ma'am, that, that is sin, and you need to repent of it, but it's not the unforgivable sin. There's only one sin that a person cannot be forgiven of, and that is rejecting the blood of Jesus Christ and his lordship in your life, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's tugging on your life. Hey, come to Christ. He'll forgive you of your sins. The Holy Spirit's tugging on you, and you keep rejecting it. As, as Stephen said to the people in Acts chapter 7, you do always resist the Holy Spirit, even as your fathers did. And it is possible for the human soul, as you hear about the love of Jesus and the forgiveness of Jesus, I don't want that. I don't need that. And you resist and you resist. And if you go through a whole lifetime and you die and they put you in a grave, in, a, in the ground, you have committed the unpardonable sin by not receiving the forgiveness that is offered to you in Christ Jesus. Do you know that there is the only unpardonable, unforgivable sin in the universe? Rejecting his son, Jesus Christ. Everything else can be forgiven. I saw an interview with Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer killed young 14-year-old boys, cut their bodies in pieces, put them in his freezer, and ate them for dinner and did it for years. In this interview I watched, I was blown away. I don't know how sincere it was. I'm not the judge over at Jeffrey Dahmer's heart, but this is what he said. They said, how could you do such a thing to young boys? He said, well, you know, I grew up believing evolution and I radically militantly believed in evolution and I believed the survival of the fittest and I believed that, in fact, the weak are conquered by the strong. They were weak, I was strong, I killed them, I ate them evolution he said but then I discovered that God gave his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for sinners and I realized I could be forgiven of my sin and he received Christ and there are those who rise up and you know upset and say man if anybody should go to hell it's a guy like Jeffrey Dahmer right is the blood of Jesus Christ able to forgive murder cannibalism it's powerful blood his blood can forgive anything except the person that won't turn and there's not only the bad sinner argument that people have, there's the good sinner argument, which I think sometimes in our culture is maybe a little more prevalent. And that is you start sharing the love, of, you know, Jesus died on the cross for your sins and his blood will wash away. Well, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm a good person and I'm really not that. I've heard your story. I'm not like you. <laughs> I had this guy tell me one time I shared my testimony with him. And after I shared my testimony, he says, I'm a nice guy. He said, I'm not like you. You needed Jesus. That's what this guy told me. I said, I agree with you. I do need Jesus. But what you don't see is you need him too because they, they, they're, they're nice guys, nice girls. And so you have to reveal to them that they're a sinner just like us. How do you do that? You walk them through the Ten Commandments. Say, well, you know, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart. You love God with all your heart? Oh, no, he's pretty low on my my list. You ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Oof, yeah. Not all the time, though. Just every now and then. You, uh, you honor your father and mother? Well, didn't when I was a teenager. Just kind of jerked to him. Okay. You ever committed adultery? Nope. Been faithful on a wife. You ever had a thought about it? Well, sure I have. Okay. You ever stole anything? A few pencils from work? Some? Well, yeah, I guess so. You ever wanted something somebody else has? Who hasn't? And I said, well, you know, if we were to go down the list, you don't love God with all your heart, which is the great, greatest commandment, so you've broken that one. You've used the Lord's name in vain, you've broken that one. You didn't honor your folks like you should, you've broken that one. You've lusted after a woman, so you've committed adultery in your heart, Jesus said. You stole something that somebody has. 
You ever lied about something? Sure, so you're a liar. But people don't think about things like that, do we? We just kind of mask it. You know, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good girl. But if you take anybody through the list of the Ten Commandments, they're all going <laughs> to end up in the same bucket. All of us are in the same bucket. We're all sinners. So you're not too bad a sinner to get, be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You're not too good a sinner to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You're not too old a sinner. You know, I mean, people are coming to church. Oh, pastor, I like you. But you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I'm in my late 70s and this is, you know, I've lived like hell and I guess I'll go there too. And, and, they, and you say, well, well, get saved, you old codger. What's your problem? At least go to heaven, be with Jesus, you know what I mean? Have your sins forgiven. Or there are those too young and you're coming in, you're a teenager, and you're, yeah, I know I should get right with Jesus, but I'm gonna have some fun first. So maybe when I get really old, like 25, I will receive Christ. And so they go through this attitude, you know, and my parents had their fun, now they're saved. They don't want me to have my fun, but I wanna have my fun. And then I'm gonna get saved later. So they think they're kind of too young. Those who think they're too old. Those who think they're too bad. Those who think they're too good. But the sinner saved by the blood of Jesus, it is the element, it is the victory that when the enemy comes and assaults me, all I have to speak to him about is the blood of the lamb who paid the price for my sin. You see, if you can see that courtroom scene with Satan coming in as the prosecuting attorney, uh, attorney and the father as the judge, and then the Lord Jesus, as it says in First John chapter 2 that he, we have an advocate with the Father which is an attorney that Jesus steps in the place and as he assaults me as he assaults you before the very throne of God the Lord Jesus says well Father what he said is true but my blood has washed away wreck sin or Bob's or Sally's or whatever your name is and so he doesn't have a leg to stand on and having been a young man that saw the inside of a courtroom a time or two when I was young there's nothing more intimidating than that judge in those robes behind that bench and that prosecuting attorney and realizing they have the goods on me and I'm in trouble. And yet in our case, spiritually speaking, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus to Christ the righteous. Not only does his blood wash away our sins, but it says by the word of our testimony, we also overcome him. And that is, you see, it says in 1 John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, if we confess with our mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what happens? As soon as I realize I'm forgiven by Jesus... With my mouth, because I've already believed in my heart, I want to tell other people about it. I, I have a testimony to share with you about the love of God. And the, and the enemy wants to shut our mouths. He wants to have us in bondage of sin and not understand the power of Jesus' blood to forgive us. And he also wants to shut our mouth from telling others the good news about Jesus. And so it's this, this struggle that, you know, as you're coming, you, you, every week I have it. Wednesday night, Saturday night, Constantly, I have this spiritual battle to get here to share with you the love of God, the forgiveness that's in Jesus, share the word, because I'm in a spiritual battle. And the enemy, man, he's beating up on me, telling me what a weak, no good, whatever I am. And I'm just telling him about the blood of the lamb. And I want you to know that it is these three things that has got me behind this block of wood for now 20 years. This November 1st will be 20 years as a pastor. And there's no way that I could have ever. There's no way that I could make it. There is absolutely no way I could make it. No way I could make it without the blood of the lamb and the Lord wanting to me to give a word of his testimony. And there's times that I'm just bummed out. My heart is heavy. I feel like the enemy is just coming down on me like a ton of bricks and I'm wrestling through it. It was about five or six months ago and the Sunday morning was getting late in the morning and, and my wife finally looked at me and she says, you better get ready. What are you doing? I said, I ain't going. <laughs> she said, what do you mean you're not going? I said, I, don't, I, can't, I can't go today. And you know, only wives can encourage you in those things in the Lord like that and, uh, and, and tell you to go get ready. So, <laughs> but if you bag out on church, no big deal, but I got to show up. How am I going to do it? I know, understand Jesus' blood has washed my sins away and he wants a word of his testimony to go forth. 
to tell others about the good news of Jesus. You always know a saved soul. Why? Because they just start talking about it. You, you don't even have to tell them that that's witnessing. They just, they just start talking about it. You say, man, you're really doing a great job witnessing. They say, what's that? They're just excited about church. They're going to work. and say, man, you got to come to church with us. It's just awesome. They have music. And then the, 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 you know, the message comes out and it tells me about it. It sounds like they've been chasing me around all week long, finding out what's going on. And you got to come. And pretty soon, there's a whole bunch of people with them because the enemy doesn't want you to do that. You know, if a new restaurant comes to town and you go to it on Friday night, on Monday morning at your co- at, when you go to work, you're telling everybody about how great it was. Whether it was when Johnny Carino's opened up or Red Robin opens up, you're like, man, we went to the new restaurant, it was great. Or you know, I guess you tell them if it stinks too, but you, you're excited about it. And I mean, if you're that way about just a restaurant, how much more should we be about telling others about Jesus when our sins are forgiven and we're going to heaven? The word of our testimony The devil, the enemy of our souls, does not want us to speak a word about the blood of Jesus. He wants us to keep our mouth shut. Don't be talking to anybody about the Lord. And you'll feel that condemnation. You'll share the Lord, and you'll be so high at that moment from sharing the Lord, and you'll come away, and all of a sudden, man, the enemy attacks, and you feel like, man, I just feel like I did something wrong, and all I did is tell that person about, welcome to the spiritual battle. Thirdly and lastly, it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. You see, Jesus came to conquer sin. He did that at the cross. And he came to conquer death. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says that all of us were held in bondage to the fear of death our whole life. It doesn't matter where you go on the planet, people are terrified to die. Because everybody knows there's something beyond this. Even the hardest atheists, they, they, they start losing their atheism on the deathbed, let me tell you. Because there is the thought that they could have been wrong. And to go wrong into eternity and stand before a God they did not believe in freaks them out. And so they're terrified. But you see, once you are no longer afraid to die, what can the world do to you? I mean, the worst it can do is kill you, right? Well, I'm ready to be with the Lord anyway. And it's that being set free that when we close our eyes on planet Earth, we're going to open our eyes in heaven. And, and you say, well, that's easy for you to say, preacher. I just got diagnosed with cancer or this or that. And I understand. Please don't get me wrong or think me insensitive or flippant about facing death. Because very honestly, humanly speaking, I'm not afraid to die, but I'm not really excited about the process that's going to happen. You know, part by part, piece by piece, how many months is it going to be a brain aneurysm that goes just off or a car wreck or this or that. What? I'm not excited about the process. Please don't get me wrong. But I'm not afraid to die because the one that I love and I've entrusted my eternity with, the one who has washed away my sins, the, ones that I, the one that I love to tell other people about, he's conquered death. And when I die, you're going to read one day in the obituaries that Rick Brown died. Don't believe it. It's bad writing. They should say, Rick Brown moved. I moved from this old tent. The Bible says this body's a tent. It's wearing out. It's getting old. The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. This old tent is going to be put in the ground. Somebody's going to throw dirt in my face. But the new man with a new body is going to be in heaven. (laughs) They'll stand one day. The preacher will stand there one day looking over my body and say, Rick, here lies just a shell. But the nut, he's gone. (laughs) And I think the Lord gives us those opportunities. You know, it was a number of years ago that I had this tumor in my left hip, and it was about the size of a chicken egg. And it had been growing, this tumor, and I had to go to the doctor to get it, you know, cut out. And it was... He just gave me a localized thing in the hip and I'm awake and I'm there and he's cutting me open and tugging on me and pulling this chicken egg sized tumor out of my hip. And cancer is rampant in my family. My mom's had cancer, my sister's beat cancer, my mom's brother has beat three different types of cancer. My grandmother died of cancer, my aunt died of cancer. I mean, you just go through the list. I mean, cancer is just rampant. My other grandmother died of cancer. So when I got this big tumor, I mean, there's several things you don't want the doctor to say. One is oops. 
and, and the other thing is, is I've never seen like this in all my years of practicing medicine. And that's what he said. And I wasn't really excited about that, but he pulls this thing. And it was so unusual because it was a tumor inside of a tumor. That's why he said it was after he got the biopsy back and he told me about it. It was a tumor inside of a tumor and it was benign. And, but as I'm laying there and the doctor's taking it out and he's telling me he's never seen anything like this and he's showing it to me and I said, time that you just, I said, Lord, I'm laying on his table. My wife's sitting there. She came in. She wanted to watch the whole procedure. I said, Lord, silently as I laid on the table, I said, Lord, if this is it, man, if this thing comes back cancerous, if, if this is it, right on. Let's get it on. I'm ready to see you. If you're done with my ministry, you're done with me. I don't want to be here a second longer than you want me to be here. Cool, Lord, just, you know, raise, raise somebody up to take over the church and do the work of the Lord. I'm ready. And I'm so thankful for that opportunity to, because you talk about it a lot, but when you're faced with it and they're pulling tumors out of your body and you're in the doctor's office and you see the seriousness upon a doctor's face, and you might have that serious look from a doctor yourself. But the devil can do nothing to me if I'm under the blood of the lamb, if I share the word of my testimony and I'm not afraid of death. All of his leverage, all of his weaponry, all of his attacks, all of his accusations, all of his garbage is to no avail. Because I am forgiven and Jesus is Lord. And one day, very soon, I'm gonna be with him. And I wonder here today, if you have that confidence. I wonder if you know that you're, you know, the blood of Jesus has washed your sins away. You know, I ask people sometimes, you're talking and, and I say, hey, are you a Christian? Are you born again? Have you received Christ? And they'll so tell me some of the strangest things when I ask that question. You try it out, you'll have some of the same. I'll say, hey, are you born again? Are, have you received Christ? Has he forgiven you of your sins? Oh, you know, <laughs> my uncle's a preacher. What's that got to do with the price of the, you know, oranges? I mean, that has nothing. What do you mean your uncle's? So does that mean because it's kind of, if your uncle's saved, then everybody gets, you know, all the nieces and nephews get in because the uncle's saved? I mean, how's that work? He said, hey, are you saved? Have you received Christ? Oh, you know, my mom and dad are some of the most committed Christians you'll ever see in your life. So? Did I ask about your mom and dad? I'm glad to hear how your mom and dad are doing but it doesn't speak to me. And some people just think that, you know, well, my mom and dad are committed Christians, so they're gonna pray me in the door. Talk to somebody to say, hey, are, are you Christian? And they'll say, oh, you know, I let my wife do the heavy spiritual lifting. She's, she got enough of Jesus for both of us. <laughs> and you know what? I know she's just gonna drag me kicking and screaming right into heaven. You said you'd let her do all the praying and that Bible stuff. And, and I don't want anything to do with that. It's, you think you're going because she loves Jesus? No. Have you heard that God has no grandchildren? God has no grandchildren. He's only got children. Meaning that you have to have a personal, intimate relationship. It's not enough for your wife to have it or your husband to have it or your aunt to have it or your uncle to have it or your parents to have it or your children to have it. If you don't know Jesus has washed away your sins and you don't have a testimony that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life and you're still terrified of death, you're gonna perish in your sin. You're gonna perish in your sin. But God has a remedy for those who would surrender their heart to him. And I pray today, be that day you finally surrender your heart to him. That you know that you know that you know you're going to heaven. Let's pray. Thank you.